This last yes or no question raised an interesting argument between Landau and Lifshitz, the famous authors of the textbook on relativity, and the Polish translator of the book, who disagreed with their claims. Mm? Hello and welcome back to the 12th episode of my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And I'm glad that you made it this far. The previous two episodes were quite technical. And if you made it through, well done. Today we are going to discuss consequences of just a simple thought experiment. <laughs> So suppose that you hold a very long and very light rigid stick and you want to move it around by waving your hand. And the far end can move very fast. And here's the question. How fast can it move? Can it exceed the speed of light? And the answer is, of course not. And that's because once you initiate the motion, the far end cannot start moving at once. It will have to wait until the information about the motion will reach it across the stick. And until that happens, the far end will remain at rest. Therefore, the whole stick will bend. And the exact motion of the stick is going to be quite complicated. But we don't care about that. All we care about right now is the conclusion that the very concept of rigid bodies is inconsistent with special relativity. So, rigid bodies do not exist. So imagine there is a guy holding a very, very long pole. And this guy wants to run into a not-so-long barn. And since the pole is longer than the barn, our guy won't be able to fit inside. Unless he starts to run with a relativistic speed. Because if he runs really, really fast, the Lorentz contraction will make him shorter And if he's fast enough, he will be able to get inside and we will be able to shut the door behind him. But there is a problem here. Because if you take the point of view of the pole itself, if you go to the frame of reference co-moving with the pole, the length of the pole is still the original one, the long one, but the barn is now moving and it is the barn that is getting shorter. And it appears that in this frame of reference, there is no way for the pole to fit inside the barn. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a paradox. The situation is good, but it is not hopeless. It is clear to us that in the first frame of reference, the short pole can fit inside the long barn. So let's try to figure out how is it possible that also in the pole's frame of reference, the long pole can still fit inside the short barn. So let's suppose that in this frame of reference, in which the pole is resting, the length of the pole is equal to p, and the length of the moving barn is equal b times the Lorentz factor, the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And we will assume that the pole can fit inside the barn in the barn's frame of reference, in which the length of the pole is p times the Lorentz factor, so that p times the Lorentz factor is smaller than b. Okay, so what really happens, what is the situation in the frame of the pole. In this frame, the barn is approaching the pole, and at some point, the front end of the pole will be hit by the wall of the barn. And what happens then? First of all, let us notice that the rear end of the pole will not react right away. It will take some time for the signal from the front end to reach the rear end, and until that happens, the rear end of the pole will remain at rest. And notice that although the heavy barn will keep crushing the pole and destroying the front of the pole, gradually moving forward, the rear end will still remain at rest. So the question is whether the signal from the front end will have enough time to reach the rear end before it is reached by the approaching door of the barn. If it's the doors that reach the far end of the pole first, we will not have the paradox because In this frame of reference, it will also be possible to lock the long pole inside the short barn. So we have to figure out what gets there first, the signal or the door. So 
Solid as the note the time of flight of the signal across the whole pole by T sig. And in the worst case scenario, if the signal is moving with the speed of light, that time of flight is equal P over C. And similarly, the time it takes the door to reach the far end of the pole, since the front end has been hit by the wall, is equal to P minus B times the Lorentz factor over speed of the door, which is just V. And the question we need to answer is, which of those times is larger? So let us compute the difference and apply the inequality in the yellow frame that defines our problem. And after some simplifications, we find that the time difference is larger than P times 1 minus V over C. And this outcome is clearly positive. This means that the doors win the race and the paradox is solved. There are plenty of other similar paradoxes related to the alleged rigidity of moving objects. Here's another example. Consider two squares moving within their common plane. And suppose that in the rest frame of one of them, the other one is moving along its diameter and by Lorentz contracting, it becomes a rhombus. So as we see, the squares will inevitably collide and the first contact will take place between the vertex of the left square and the edge of the right square, leaving a clear mark of a collision. Consider the same situation in the rest frame of the right square. It is clear that in this frame, the first impact will take place between the right vertex and the left edge, leaving the mark of the collision elsewhere. And let's denote it with a yellow spot. Since the location of the dent cannot depend on the choice of the reference frame, there must be a flow in our reasoning somewhere. So what is the correct description and where did we make a mistake? Let us notice that in the rest frame of the center of weight, both squares are moving symmetrically with the opposite velocities and undergoing identical Lorentz contractions, which turns them into identical rhombuses colliding at their edges. In this frame of reference, the earlier mentioned vertices will collide simultaneously. Therefore, the space-time interval between those two collisions, the red collisions and the yellow collisions, has to be negative. And it follows that in any other frame of reference, the instantaneous point of collision must move along the edge with a speed higher than C and the consecutive colliding pieces will not have enough time to find out that their neighbors have already collided. No kinetic energy will be dispersed and the vertices will not leave any clear dents. There is no paradox. So finally, let us discuss one more tricky question. Imagine the following peculiar case involving a stationary core and a thin circle rotating around it without any friction. By analyzing each piece of the circle, we could conclude that, due to its motion, it should Lorentz contract. In such a scenario, we would expect that the circumference of the circle to shrink through a decrease of the diameter. However, the core constrains that from happening. So the question is whether the inability of the circle to Lorentz contract will generate internal reaction forces that may lead to breaking of the circle, or not. So, what do you think? Will the circle eventually break due to some internal forces? Let me know in the comments. This last yes or no question raised an interesting argument between Landau and Lifshitz, the famous authors of the textbook on relativity, and the Polish translator of the book, who disagreed with their claims mm -hmm. and left a famous asterisk and a comment in a section of the book discussing a similar problem. I'm giving a solution to this problem in my textbook on relativity called Unusual Expression Relativity. You can get it through the link in the description. And that's it for today, so get out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs>